Excellent. What's up guys, welcome to Probing Paul. This is my monthly Q&A segment where you guys ask questions and I answer them. All the questions I'm gonna be answering from today are posted uh, last month's video, uh, Probing Paul number 13. We're now into Probing Paul number 14. Uh, and, and there all of my old Probing Pauls are going all the way back into in, into the past and history. Um, but real quick, a side note right here from the beginning. Uh, if you haven't noticed, I got a bunch of Ryzen processors. I am in the works on an overclocking video on those. I was planning on posting that today, but it's been slightly delayed, but it should be up in the next day or two. Uh, let's get right into this with our first question, which is posted on last month's Probing Paul from Cade Ramirez. What should you do with old PC parts, what is the best way to going about selling them? I'm assuming by the second part of your question that you're intending to sell old PC parts. And there are a few things that I try to uh, do in order to make selling old PC parts more easy. Uh, first off is to make sure you keep the retail box and all of the accessories. That's a great way to show a potential buyer that you care about the product and you were caring enough about it to keep tabs on all that stuff so that when you can sell it, you say, look, here's not just this motherboard, but also the IO shield and any little bits and pieces that might have come with it that they might need for a build, even if you didn't need for it. Uh, a second thing would be to make sure it works, uh, to get good photos of the thing actually working and functional uh, is a great way to ensure people that when they're buying it used, that they're actually going to get a functional part. Uh, offering some sort of means of, of retraction or return if uh, the part does happen to be bad when the person gets it uh, is a good way to provide a little bit more assurance as well because uh, used PC parts that's usually the biggest concern is buying something that doesn't work and then uh, I'd make sure that if you're using existing platforms like eBay, uh, eBay is a good way to do it, but you do tend to lose a decent chunk of money paying the eBay commissions and that kind of thing. And then if you're using like a local service like Craigslist or something like uh, LetGo, just make sure that you abide by the best practices for those as well. Meet in a public place, make sure the person's on the legit, make sure you confirm everything beforehand as far as price and that thing, that kind of thing. And with all that, you should uh, be able to get a good value for your used parts and then also hand them on to someone who might get some better use out of them. Next is Alex the Sniper 19. What is your opinion on the Ryzen gaming performance? My opinion is still evolving over time, but I'd say it's pretty good right now. Now granted, right when Ryzen 7 launched, people were looking for what you could nitpick about it because that's what reviewers do. They find the shortcomings of a product and they tend to focus on those. So a lot of people got a little upset because it was like, oh, Ryzen 7, you shouldn't be gaming at 1080 anyway and that kind of thing. But I thought it was valid as far as the criticisms go. I was a little concerned about where it might go from there because in my experience, there hasn't been a lot of benefit to be gained in CPU performance with games as time goes on, uh, as you might expect with something like a graphics card. But it's already been shown that uh, some pretty significant performance boosts can be obtained. Uh, we've seen it demonstrated with Ashes of the Singularity already with the, that game update specifically for Ryzen. Uh, we've seen it with some more specific power plans that have been integrated into, into Windows 10 that do a little bit better job there. So I think the Ryzen gaming performance is good, borderline towards great, which is I think where Intel would be if you're, if you're lining that up with, at least with their newest generation of stuff. And I think the potential is only for it to get better. So especially with the Ryzen 5 launch uh, that happened earlier this week, I think there's a lot more options for people out there who wants uh, a higher core count, higher thread, th thread count processor. They can still do perfectly fine in games. Hopefully we'll see some of those outlying scenarios where Ryzen is lagging behind in really CPU limited situations with specific games catching back up. But I'd say overall it's great. Uh, it's a great competitor to Intel, and I'm having no problem recommending the Ryzen processors, especially the Ryzen 5s that have just come out, especially if you're looking for a nice bang for your buck. Next is Bruno Gabriel, Cal Bruno Gabriel Cavalcanti. You may be your Italian. Uh, in your opinion, is it better to take a 1063 gig or RX 470 for playing at higher, very high settings? I kind of answered a question similar to this last month, but I thought I'd address this one more time. Uh, first off, if you're getting the 1063 gig, I might reconsider. Uh, the 1063 gig I just is, is pretty hamstrung by the limited amount of uh, memory that's there, and you will eventually outpace it, especially if you're considering upgrading to a higher resolution monitor in the future, or if you're playing at high and very high settings, bumping those settings up can uh, really eat up the system memory, depending on the game, of course. I would lean towards the, towards the 470, especially if you can get an 8 gig 470, or just hold out for a, a bit longer because there's tons of rumors about the 500 series coming out from AMD which should have a, an RX 580 and 570 replacements for the 470 and 480 and um, it, it would be interesting to, to see what your options are after that happens although we don't know for sure when it's actually going to happen hopefully soon though 
Next from Epic Kingdom. Should I sell my 1080 SC for around $450 to $500 and put that money towards GTX 1080 Ti purchase? Now, my my advice would have been, and sorry that this was three weeks ago, but hopefully it's still relevant. If you're going to do something like that, if you're going to sell a high-end graphics card right when the next highest-end graphics card comes out, you should do it right away because the view and opinion of the 1080 being the top GPU is going to slowly start to deteriorate as there's better cards or faster, more performing cards above it. So I'd say that do that do that more quickly if you can when the better card comes out. And then this is really an enthusiast thing. Like you're saying, I really have a very nice graphics card that can handle just about anything. You're also not telling me what your resolution you're playing at or that kind of thing is. Um, I understand. I understand wanting to have the, the best and the fastest that's out there. Um, but yeah, I guess that'd be my advice. Do it quickly or do it before the 1080 Ti even comes out, obviously that's that can't help you out right now. If you hear rumors that the next card's gonna come out and you have like the ability to like sell your existing card and get by with something else for a while, maybe that's an option too. But it's kind of hard to stay at the top of uh, the, the fastest GPU game without dropping a bit of money. So thank you for that question. Sean Fitz1234, hey Paul, is there a way to duplicate my 250 gig SSD onto a partition on my two terabyte hard drive as a backup. There's actually quite a few ways you can do this and it's definitely a very good thing to do. And actually I, for quite some time, uh, would, would show people how to do it using this. This is the backup and restore Windows 7 function. So it's available in Windows 7, it's available in Windows 8, it's available in Windows 10, although in Windows 10 it's labeled as backup and restore Windows 7. Here you can uh, do a couple different things. The one that I like to do is create a system image. You can do this right after you install your operating system, get all your drivers installed, get whatever basic programs you want onto there. And then uh, the system image utility will let you take an image of your existing operating system drive, your SSD, and back it up to an attached mechanical drive or something like that. That will make an instantaneous snapshot of your, oh, I can't, my this is this has blocked my shortcut keys from working. Here we go. That'll make an instantaneous snapshot of your operating system in the state that it is, and then you can use the Windows 10 uh, installer or Windows 7 installer, boot off of it, load that uh, snapshot, and then overwrite your SSD, and then you kind of be back to where you started. Now, if you're looking for something that's more iterative, iterative that sort of does backups as you go, so you can like be like, I want to roll back to like a backup from a week ago, that also exists in here. You can set up a backup drive. You can tell it how frequently you want it to backup and everything. I don't think I've set one up on here yet, but again, it'll allow you to choose your mechanical drive or whatever to back up to. You can also save to a network drive, and that will actually do snapshots as you go along that you can kind of roll back to. So those are the functions that are built into Windows. Um, beyond that, I would suggest uh, if you want to pay some money for something, uh, get Acronis. Uh, because that's been the software that I've had the best experience with as far as just working, not having to do anything funky. And then if you want to get uh, a little bit uh, dirtier, get, get your hands a little bit dirtier, maybe consider like Clonezilla, uh, which I believe is open source and free, um, but it's definitely a little bit tougher on the learning curve to sort of set up and use. Next question here from Rick Budzak. He said, wait, is that a Tamron 90 millimeter f2.8 macro lens sitting there? Uh, yes. Yes, it is. It's right here. Now, this is my macro lens. So anytime I need like a super close up on something, uh, I use this one. It's a very nice little lens. I think it wasn't too expensive. I think it was only like three or 400 bucks, which isn't terribly expensive when it comes to nicer, decent lenses. It's very large. Like when you, when you actually focus, it gets, it extends quite a bit. Uh, but any, anytime you've seen me do videos like on a processor, like the Ryzen processors that just launched and I have those close up shots with the very shallow depth of field and, and bokeh going on and stuff like that, that's with this lens. I like it a lot. It's an EF mount lens, and I use it with the uh, Metabones adapter for my GH4. And uh, it's a great option if I need to get super, super close up on, at something. I'm really, really glad that I got it. Nick Roth asks, what do you do with your completed monthly builds when you're done benchmarking? Now, Nick, when you asked this, I had not yet posted my, uh, this video, which is what happens to my monthly PC builds, which is sort of an answer to your question. Um, although this one was honestly also part, partially just like a, a, a slight mini documentary of our trip to Vegas where we shot guns and did other things as well. So it was a little random, uh, but it was fun. And at the end of this video, I delivered uh, all, or at least like, like, like four sevenths of the parts from that uh, to Jennifer, who has been uh, helping me out on my channel and uh, is also a good old friend of mine. So, um, Basically, I try to find uses for them, I guess would be the, the, the final question to that. Uh, often I'll take them apart, 
set the parts aside uh, and use those parts in future builds and that kind of thing. If I can find a good home for it, I'll definitely try to do that. Um, and then sometimes I do end up selling parts here and there, but often I just don't have time to do that. So I end up with parts piling up, which is, I know, not a terrible problem to have, but I'm working on other solutions for it. So I guess that's sort of an answer for you. I try to find friends who need them and, and hand them down or whatever. Sometimes I do some sales. Sometimes I just keep the stuff around here. And then sometimes, of course, the parts that are sent over I need to return back to the vendor. Uh, just kind of depends on the situation, how many uh, marketing samples they have, and that kind of thing. A couple more questions here from CyberTonto72. I have a PCI Express 2 motherboard, PCIe Gen 2. Looking to get a new graphics card with PCI Express Gen 3. Will that card work? Uh, short answer here is yes. PCIe Gen 3 is backwards compatible to PCIe Gen 2. You're going to lose about half the bandwidth uh, with Gen 2 versus Gen 3. So like a PCIe Gen uh, 2 by 16 interface has... Oh gosh, I'm going to forget these numbers. Here's the actual chart on uh, Wikipedia. You get with 3.0, you have a transfer rate of 8 giga transfers per second. So by 16 gives you something close to 16 gigabytes per second, which is roughly double the 8 gigabytes per second that you get with PCIe Express Gen 2. Now does that matter? No, uh, in, in by and large, no. Yes, Gen 3 is a little bit faster when it's actually tested. It's like a couple percentage points, maybe faster. So you will get a little, slightly better performance with Gen 3, but you can still work with Gen 2. In my opinion, you'd probably be suffering from more of a CPU bottleneck if you have a motherboard that actually goes back and is only Gen 2 compliant. You must be on uh, maybe Sandy Bridge or something like that. Um, but you'll still be just fine for now. So I would say go ahead, get your graphics card, do that upgrade, uh, and then you know just keep an eye on your performance and then plan to eventually upgrade the rest of your system in the meantime, because if you're on Gen 2, uh, your motherboard and processor are starting to get a bit out of date. Daniel Jensen has a question on the topic of poop looking, because that's one of the last questions I answered in the last video. Which way does your toilet paper roll, inwards or outwards? Uh, I would do, I don't know what you mean, but I think outwards. The the if the roll's here, the, the flap should be hanging on this side, and you're on this side. Um, and that is because I don't have cats. I will give it to anyone who has cats, put it on the inside, it keeps them from doing the claw thing. I've, I've never experienced that myself, but I've heard that's a thing. Uh, outwards, it's just, it makes more sense. It's easier to, to, to get at, uh, and, and you don't have to, like, reach underneath. And, like, you know, you could po possibly injure yourself doing something like that, I think. So... That's what I go for. Finally, Arcadius Zero, Arca Arcadius Zero said uh, we can hear his dog breathing. Yes, Hero was snoring in the last episode of Probing Paul. Uh, fortunately, he is still over there snoozing, but he has not been snoring this time, so got around that. But guys, that's all the time I have for today for Probing Paul, so thank you so much for watching this video. And of course, if you have questions for me for next month, please post them in the comment section down below. I'm going to wrap this up, and then I'm going to get right back to benchmarking and overclocking Ryzen 5. So I have a video on that coming very soon. Uh, and of course, if you want to hit the thumbs up button and like the video uh, or leave me any other comments you have, please feel free to do that as well. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.